Good day and welcome to CIM event brought to you by the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. Today, we'll be talking about inclusive diversity and workplace equity in the natural resource sector for the 21st century. My name is Mary Lou Reboulis, Client Relations at CIM. Thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, we have some housekeeping. If you joined with your video, make sure you selected the computer audio button on your control panel. If you dialed with a traditional phone, ensure the phone button is selected. During the presentation, you'll be asked to participate in some polls. Please type or select the multiple choice answers in the poll box in your control panel. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the question box in the control panel. The questions will be addressed at the end of the pres presentation. And now with further ado, I'd like to present the moderator of this session, Simone Henscher. Simone is a member of CIM's Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee. She is manager at Mind Technical Services for Rio Tinto based in California. Welcome Simone, thank you. Thank you, Mary Lou. And uh, welcome to everybody to this evening's webinar. Um, I'm pleased to inform you that we are recording this webinar and it will be available on the diversity and inclusion section of CIM's website. I'm thrilled to tell you today that we have attendees from Canada, USA, the UK, Pakistan, Australia, Philippines, and Peru. So this is actually the widest group we've had so far. So we're very excited to be hosting all of you. Um, so before we get started, we do have a poll question for you. And so the question is on inclusive diversity and workplace equity in the natural resource sector for the 21st century. So the poll will come up momentarily. Okay, it looks like most people have uh, participated in the poll, Mary Lou. Thank you. Yes, we're good, thank you. And do we have a slide for Wendy, uh, just to introduce her? Perfect. So I'm very excited to introduce our speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Wendy Sukier is the Diversity Institute founder, academic director of the Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub and research lead of the Future Skills Center. She is the co-author of the bestseller, Innovation Nation, Canadian leadership from Java to Jurassic and former VP of Research and Innovation. The Diversity Institute focuses on dimensions of diversity and inclusion in the workplace, future skills and entrepreneurship and innovation. Harnessing the power of innovation, it promotes the advancement of an underrepresented group. Uh, sorry, of underrepresented groups. Wendy holds a PhD and MBA and MA and honorary doctorates from Laval and Concordia. So thank you, Wendy, for speaking with us this evening. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I will try to share my screen, which is always something of a challenge. And I will ask that you tell me if you can see it. Now. You're great. I can see it, Wendy. Thank you. I've, um, I'm sure that there's sort of two t-shirts I should have. One is you're on mute and the other, is I will try to share my screen. It's uh, um, transitioning to this new world is, is uh, a challenge. So uh, I wanted to welcome everyone and thank you very much for, um, for having me. 
Um, it's not an industry that I'm terribly familiar with, so my we pulled together a bit of uh, a bit of background information. But the work that we do at the Diversity Institute really focuses on, um, as was mentioned, how to leverage research and evidence in order to drive real change. And we've worked across a number of sectors. And uh, I will acknowledge that a lot of what we're doing is uh, very Canada focused. So I'm hoping that we'll have time during the chat um, for others on the call from uh, around the world to share what's going on in, in their environments. So um, we, I, the Diversity Institute's in a business school, so we focus specifically on um, how diversity and inclusion advance organizational objectives and um you know there are a number of ways to look at this one is through the hr lens and to think about how you access the best and the brightest and i was on a um, conference today where people were talking a lot about how we don't put enough of a, a dollar value on retention for instance so given the training and the effort they put into employees um, being able to keep them is really important. And so we're not just talking about the talent pool that you bring into the organization. It's, it's also how we keep people from leaving the organization it becomes really important. Um, as markets get um, increasingly diverse, understanding, um, understanding the dimensions of diversity it becomes very important. And your sector, I'm not really sure what the what the analogy would be, but I guess um, you know you perhaps uh, produce precious minerals, and there are clearly differences in different in different countries and markets in terms of you know what uh, what standard of gold, what kind of gemstones are particularly desired. Um, I imagine with other dimensions of diversity, looking at um, um, you know the energy sector and so on, there are shifting preferences that that have to be taken into account. The uh, fostering innovation, creativity, diversity of thought—that's um, pretty obvious. If you have people with different views, you're going to get different perspectives, and um, you know companies like Xerox have have had a look at um, what happens when you increase the diversity of teams and the impact that that then has on, on um, for example, the production of IP and patents. We know as well that organizations that do a good job on diversity and inclusion are more likely to have high levels of employee satisfaction and engagement. And we know that if they don't do this well, um, there are huge legal and reputational costs. And from the little that I know about the mining industry, um, community relations, particularly with diverse groups, seem to be absolutely fundamental in, in, some, um, in some parts of the world. And so, uh, you know, managing those relationships requires um, real insight into diversity and inclusion. And this is just, uh, a uh, way of kind of differentiating the concepts. So equality, you know, the equal rights movement was basically a movement to give women the vote, to allow them to own property, to treat everybody the same way. In the mid eighties, towards the nineties, people started to better understand this notion of equity, which is recognizing historic disadvantage among certain certain uh, parts of the population in Canada, for example, we have a big focus on Indigenous people. Um, in the in the United States, obviously, there's a, a big focus on the Black community, especially because of the history of slavery. So um, there's a recognition when we talk about equity that treating everybody equally doesn't necessarily level the playing field because some people have privilege that comes from uh, their history, their socioeconomic status, and so on. And then the idea with inclusion is really um, 
that uh, we're re removing the barriers and that people feel like they belong. And the the typical um, common comment is is uh, diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being um, asked to dance. So we have to be clear about some of those concepts. The identity issues vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So the way in which in Canada we define different um, diversity and equity categories is very different from the categories that are used in the US or the UK or, or other parts of world, the world. But um, most, most countries pay attention to issues around gender, looking at women versus men. And um, it's worth noting that sometimes people use, use men and women, male and female interchangeably. Generally, we think of male and female as pertaining to sex or your biological characteristics, whereas gender is something that relates to your social uh, identity. Similarly, in Canada, the, the common comment, the, the common term right now is racialized people. Our legislation, though, uses um, terminology like visible minority. Um, in the United States, the, the typical categories are white, black, Hispanic, and, and other. Canada, because of our, our makeup, has very high um, uh, proportion of the population who, for example, are from South Asia or from China, who would be considered uh, visible minority or racialized people, along with um, people who are Black. In Canada, the Black population is relatively small. In Canada, we also talk about Indigenous people. Um, and they're distinctive. There's First Nations, Métis, or Inuit. Um, certainly in many of the countries where um, you probably have operations, issues around Indigenous people are really core and critical. We also look at people with disabilities and then um, LGBTQ2S+, looking at different um, sexual orientation and, and gender identity and this notion of intersectionality, which is when these things um, when these things come together, you will find, for example, racialized women face more barriers than white women. Racialized women who have a disability will face more barriers than racialized women without a disability. And this really came to um, a head in our research when we looked at the city of Toronto where 50% of the population is racialized and 50% of the population is white. And yet when you looked at corporate boards, white women outnumbered racialized women 12 to one, even though they were one to one in the population. So increasingly, when people look at diversity and inclusion, they're talking about intersectionality and making sure that, for example, we're not just focused on replacing the white men with white women, but we're looking at, at the dimensions of diversity. There's a lot of attention that's been focused on this notion of unconscious bias. And if you haven't done the implicit bias test, I'd really encourage you to do it because what it tests is basically the extent to which we have internalized certain assumptions. And I've worked on uh, women in technology for 30 years trying to advance more women in engineering, most more women in computer science. And I have to say, we haven't made a ton of progress. When I did the implicit association test, it showed that in spite of my 30 years of work, I associate science and technology with men, and I associate arts and humanities with women. And the way this tests, it, it basically tests you based on how long it takes you to make a decision and to associate different words. And I found, even though, of course, you know, in, in diversity and inclusion is, is front and center, I will more quickly associate science and technology with men, and I will have to stop and think before I associate it with women. So there's some very, I mean, it was, it was really, it was really interesting. And it just sort of reinforces the fact that we all have biases. And if you want to drive diversity and inclusion, 
the key is just self-awareness and recognizing that you have certain preferences that you gravitate towards certain kind of people and 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 understanding when you do that and making sure that you're more objective and fair in your dealings so um i i regret to say that when you look at the data um canadian mining companies not doing so well when it comes to uh diversity on boards or on their executive teams, although they're moving in the right direction. And part of this is just a, a long standing history and a very highly um, uh, inbred uh, association of mining and men. In fact, you know, historically, there were there were laws that prohibited women from working as miners. Um, until uh, like 1978, which is as when I graduated from university, um, it was the first time women were legally permitted to work underground in mines. And so this culture of masculinity is deeply, deeply embedded in the industry, but also in how people look at the industry. So very few, I don't know if there's minor Barbie yet, but my, my guess is very few women see mining as as part of their future um, and it would be really interesting to understand how how women who choose mining come to those decisions did they grow up in a family of miners did they um did they uh you know have a summer job that got them interested but it's 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 clear that even when women do choose to move into mining, uh, they face lots of barriers and often um, they leave. So the, the industry has what we would call a leaky pipeline, which means not a lot of women come in, but even when they do come in, um, they may not stick around. The other thing that's kind of um, disappointing is that the improvement is, in the sector Kind of lags behind progress that we've seen in in other other, other industries and in fact in some areas um, things have have gone in the other direction board representation is kind of stuck in the teens other sectors you'll see are closer to 30 percent or more and so there's lots of there's lots of data in here and we'll share the presentation for those of you who who would like um, more, more information, but you can see the comparisons between um, the mining sector versus the Toronto Stock Exchange, list, exchange listed companies versus um, the uh, Standards and Poor TSX uh, companies. And um, it's also similar patterns when we look at, at executives. Um, like I said, progress looks pretty flat to me, um, and and those are things that people probably want to want to consider. The only sector that is below mining in terms of the representation of women, I guess, oil and gas is behind mining and uh, energy services as well. Both when we look at directors and when we look at executive officers, um, again. Uh, very modest uh, progress, but uh, progress nevertheless. And so I think that that puts you um, up there now with life sciences in terms of uh, in terms of board representation. Um, not much movement in terms of executive level. And so there there are questions that have been that have been undertaken to try to understand why women aren't in mining. And part of it is that women don't choose mining. So it's it's not just an issue of organizational policies and practices. It's also um, not, uh, not an occupation that women um, necessarily consider. Not a lot of women go into things, into some of the um, pipeline disciplines like uh, geology, for example. And I think, um, you know, as with many um, technology um, roles like engineering, there, there's a perception of, of a certain kind of work that is not appealing. When you look at um, 
when you look at some of the best practices around uh, EDI, Osler does a report every year that, that sort of reviews where, um, where organizations are. And I just, I pulled, I pulled a few of these out that really tie to some of the best practices I'll be talking about um, previously. So, and, and there may be others around the table that are doing some of these things as well. But when we think about, and when we think about how to drive diversity and inclusion, tone at the top is really important. And the president and CEO of, of Gold Core is, is part of the Catalyst Accord and the 30% Club which is committed to increasing representation on boards. Um, they've introduced diversity policies. They have a senior person responsible for diversity. They're starting to track what they're doing internally to build, um, to build the pipeline. And um, bringing in men as allies is really important as is partnering with universities. And I don't know any of these people. I don't know any of these companies. I'm just telling you what uh, what Osler found. Tech um, is another one that has taken this very seriously and embedded um, uh, leadership with a diversity um, a diversity committee at the executive level. They also joined the 30% Club. Um, they're trying to introduce gender neutral language. So I guess you don't have four men anymore you have four people or i'm not sure what but clearly there are ways that you can you can um you can make people feel more included um they've they've tackled unconscious bias and respectful workplace training in an effort to drive culture uh, cameco has has also really tackled diversity and inclusion through their HR practices, um, looking at their employment systems, their policies, and trying to figure out where the barriers are. Um, they've done something really interesting, which is to tie their corporate diversity and inclusion targets to annual bonuses. You know, they've put their money where their mouth is, and they're actually tying performance rewards to achieving uh, diversity and inclusion targets, which is really leading edge. Um, they're also, it looks to me from the outside that they're very focused on consultation and engagement with employees to really understand what they need to change and how to do it. And they have feedback loops in their action plan. Ariva has, um, has tackled this issue in, in a number of ways. One of them is that it really focuses on um, uh, what I would call policies and processes aimed at creating a more inclusive culture. Looking, and especially with COVID, we've seen this is becoming even more critical, but building in things like uh, flexible work schedules and personal leave days. Um, they had a teleworking program before COVID, which, um, you know, everyone <laughs> seems now has teleworking programs, but um, it, that's something that many people, women as well as people with disabilities, for example, are often in need of. Um, and uh, lots of flexibility around, uh, around work schedules, access to daycare and so on. And um, they're partnering with the Edwards, Edwards School of Business on a women, a women mentorship program. Uh, to link women to, to mentors and sponsors. Uh, Barrett Gold is um, another organization that is, is um, undertaking specific uh, initiatives and activities. They're collaborating with White Ribbon. Uh, White Ribbon started in Canada after the Montreal massacre, but it's now global. I know um, when I was in Brazil, the White Ribbon campaign was a big deal. It's focused on bringing men and women together to end violence against women. And they're tackling violence prevention through the company's mind sites. Um, Agrium is a partner and a donor to the Canadian Women's Foundations, one of my favorite charities, um, which really positions it in this, this kind of outreach community development CSR space. And I know many, many other organizations 
um, have local initiatives um, aimed at creating opportunities in their communities. There are lots of organizations that have uh, um, some focus on trying to encourage and reward and celebrate women in mining. And this is just, these are just the ones that we, we came across, Women in Mining Canada, Global Inspiration Women in Mining, um, the Canadian Centre for Women in Science, Engineering, Trades and Technologies covers a lot of different sectors, including mining. Um, Gold Core again has has linked with some of the educational institutions to try to raise the profile and attention specifically on mining. There are lots of programs dealing with engineering that um, have a mining uh, dimension and so on and so forth. I love the last one. I don't know what they do, but Women Who Rock seems like a perfect name. So when we when we think about all of this, um, you know, one of the things that we've done a lot of at the Diversity Institute is try to figure out how you actually drive change. And organizations exist within very complex ecosystems. They don't exist in a vacuum. And we have to recognize that at the societal level, there are really profound stereotypes that just reinforce certain values. And those values are part of what shape the expectations of young people, including women, and also the way in which they're treated. Um, so there are a lot of things that we need to think about at the societal level that have um, have an impact. And, and the, the Government of Canada has introduced, um, for example, legislation like um, Bill C-25, which applies to distributed distributing companies that are federally incorporated. They've also just launched the 5030 challenge to include um, corporations to increase gender equality, so that's the 50, as well as diversity, which is the 30, on their boards and in their senior leadership teams. And I'll use this as an example. I should have pulled up, I don't know what happens if you if you do a Google image search on minor, but my guess is the result is pretty much the same. This is what you get if you do a Google search on entrepreneur. And um, you can see there are very few women in this. Uh, I can tell you if you you should try this, do a Google image search on carpenter. You'll see Jesus, carpenter ants, and Karen Carpenter, the singer, before you'll find a women, a woman carpenter. At least when I did the search, that's what I saw. So really thinking about the images that we're sharing, who's speaking at events, who we're celebrating. Um, as I said, I'm not a Barbie fan, but but uh, but those things really really matter. And and this is part of this whole um, you know focus on trying to challenge and counter stereotypes on on many levels. And I'm sure in your sector that's a big piece of it. The other thing that we really focus on is a sort of systematic approach to assessing diversity and inclusion. And what I would argue is that often organizations get into a bit of a numbers game and it just becomes, you know, checking the boxes. And what, what we believe is that if you don't embed diversity and inclusion at every, every step in your strategy, um, it will just remain ticking boxes. So we've all, I've already given you some examples of these, you know, tone at the top, leadership and governance, a number of a number of mining executives have signed up for things like the 30% challenge and made very clear statements about their aspirations. Looking at organizational culture, I'll talk more about some of the things that can be done there. Thinking about diversity and inclusion through the entire value chain. Who are you doing business with? Um, you know, who are the suppliers? How are you, how are you doing your R&D? Are you thinking about um, different uh, different uh, communities when you when you do your outreach and that's why you know it's kind of interesting that that some see the Canadian Women's Foundation as an important partner. HR practice is clear of course measurement of course what gets measured gets done 
And then I would talk about integrated strategies for outreach and community building. And we have a, we have, you know, there are lots of these assessment tools. We have an assessment tool that just goes through these different categories and checks um, on whether or not, for example, if you say you want to increase your diversity and inclusion on the board, do you have a skills matrix that looks at what skills are required and, and includes diversity and inclusion as part of what's required? Do you have prop policies and processes in, in place? When you look at risk, are you considering the risks associated with getting this wrong? You can drill into your HR practices, look at your recruitment, your selection, your promotion. Do you have programs in place to attract um, people that are not part of part of your industry? Uh, what initiatives do you have in place? Because you know we know that little girls and little boys form their ideas about what they're going to be when they grow up at a very very young age. And so you really do have to get people to understand um, what mining is about and what the opportunities are at a very early age. And I remember I was at, um, I was at, uh, um, what's it called? The Ideas Conference that Moses Namier uh, runs every year in Toronto. And one year they devoted it to mining and they it was mind blowing. They were talking about you know, how technology is being used in mining and the kinds of jobs that exist in mining. I didn't know any of that stuff. You know, in my head, it's people with, with uh, you know, cold, darkened faces and, and lights, on their, uh, lights on their helmets. Like that's my image of a miner. So I think there's lots that can be done to develop outreach to places where you might find people who are not currently thinking about mining as a destination for employment and really unpacking all of the processes at every stage. I know that in, for example, technology intensive um, companies, you can often get a, a, a sort of practice in place where you need to be an engineer to do all sorts of things that actually if you unpacked what the skills required were, you would quickly understand didn't need you to be an engineer. And software developers caught on to this quite early on. Companies like Shopify, for example, don't even, they don't, not only do they not require a degree in computer science, they don't actually require um, a degree at all. They, they base their recruitment on, on aptitude testing, and then they train to train to roll. And if you want to engage with, for example, Indigenous communities, it may be that you have to reconsider what your entry requirements are and ask yourself the question, does this really need a university degree or are we just using a university degree um, to make it easier to weed people out? Because that's often what credentials are for. It's not that they're actually required to do the job, it's that it's a, it's a way of not having to look at 2000 um, resumes. So there are lots of things that you can do digging into HR. Values and culture, um, how you communicate um, commitments around harassment and, and diversity and inclusion becomes really important. And making sure policies are not just words on paper. You know, you show people quickly that you're not gonna tolerate certain kinds of behavior. Um, and you can actually change culture by, um, by having policies and programs in place that you enforce. Engagement surveys can help you understand what the lived experience of people in the organization are, and tracking that over time can really help. I'm a big believer in metrics, and you know, it's not that, that numbers tell the whole story. I think you need to dig in more deeply and have you know, conversations with employees about their their experience. But I'm I I do think that having um, having dashboards that look at um, that look at diversity and inclusion and and tr and assess some of those dimensions we talked about are really important. Thinking about diversity and inclusion across the value chain, um, whether we're looking at R and D, whether we're looking at procurement 
whether we're looking at you know operations and outbound outbound logistics sales or services and i know that you most of you probably work more in the b2b space but still there are ways that you can think about um, everything from from how you're designing your processes to how you're 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 building your minds through a, an edi lens at the end of the day organizations are really just agglomerations of peoples and so really um looking at your own unconscious bias looking at your own privilege thinking about um thinking about assumptions that you may have about other people becoming more aware of of microaggressions um because very often what you say and what you intend is not necessarily received in the way um, it was as expected. And this was explained to me, it was, I'll just share it. Um, a, a black woman I know said to me um, how offended she was in a, in a conversation because someone said to her, you're so articulate. I heard the same thing from another black woman who is a, a member of parliament. Now me, as a white person listening to that, someone says you're articulate. Blah. What is wrong with that? What's wrong with that is the, the notion that you're articulate and that's unusual and exceptional, exceptional because most people like you are not. That's what someone who is, who is black often hears if you say you're articulate. I've talked to lots of black women who, who will recount story after story after story where people come and touch their hair or make comments about their hair or jokes about them not needing, uh, you know, suntan lotion. Someone may think that those are harmless comments, but to the person on the receiving end, what they may be saying is you're different. You don't, what they may be hearing is you're different and you don't really belong here. Microaggressions, you know, overt discrimination, racism, People seem now prepared to acknowledge that they actually exist, which is a first step to, to tackling them. But microaggressions, really, really hard. And, you know, women experience these on a regular basis and men don't even see them happening. And the, the best example, um, you know, and this comes up over and over, if it were a, a, a full audience, I would hear the, the outburst of laughter, I think. Um, but, women will say something in a meeting and then a few minutes later a man will say exactly the same thing and what the man said will be heard and people go oh what a great great idea bob you're a genius right and the woman whose idea it was is sitting there going you know what am i chopped liver but there's lots of research that suggests that often when women speak they're not heard and no one's paying attention and and understanding how those echo chambers can can be created and reinforced really really important and there are all kinds of strategies for how to deal with some of these issues in meetings or or in the workplace um regardless of who you are being a mentor and and seeking out a mentor or a sponsor those things are really really important and and again to tackle unconscious bias really being self-reflective and when you're making a judgment about somebody asking yourself the question am i making that judgment because of my assumptions about what women are like or what men are like it is really important i mean the research is kind of horrifying but what it shows is men don't like working for women women don't like working for women either. And some of the worst stories you'll hear, for example, from women surgeons or, or senior lawyers are, are the stories of conflicts that they have with women who are nurses or, or legal assistants who are so socialized into thinking that their job is to serve men that they really don't adapt well when women come in and these again you know these are not anecdotal stories there's a lot of research to support it so really thinking about that is is important and then the other thing that's critically important is 
not being a bystander. I mean, I get sick of being the gender police. I'm always thrilled when men will step up and ask, where are the women? Why are the women not here? Why aren't we doing something? Um, because, you know, I'd rather be talking about other dimensions of diversity. But when we think about microaggressions or even, you know, overt, terrible um, examples of, of racism and sexism and even violence, very often there are people who know what's going on and they don't say anything. And that's kind of a recurrent theme. If you look at any of the big scandals around uh, sexual abuse or harassment in the workplace, they're not, a, not isolated incidents and lots of people knew, but they didn't do anything about it. So creating an organization in which bad behavior is simply not tolerated and where people have multiple channels for, for dealing, with, um, um, dealing with bad behavior becomes very, very important. And regardless where you are in the organization, you have the power to, to create change. One of the most powerful tools that um, we've we've used, and again, you know, we can share this with you, is trying to get at the issue of privilege. So there's a lot that's been um, discussed about the problems of white privilege and the fact that if you grow up white, there are just certain things that you can take for granted that you can't take for granted if you're black. Um, going into a store and not being followed not being stopped by the police for for doing nothing other than driving a good a, a good car um and so on and so forth like they're just things that we can take for granted if we're white that uh, you can't take for granted if you're if you're black and that's where the whole notion of white privilege came from but i would argue that privilege takes a variety of different forms it isn't just about the color of your skin although clearly that's a big piece of it if you had parents, if you grew up in Canada and both your parents spoke English or French, that's a kind of privilege because if you grew up and your parents didn't speak either English or French, who helped you with your homework, who navigated the complicated applications for university, who gave you advice on, on what you were gonna be when you grow up. If you have parents who went to university, chances are you have more opportunities. If you had parents who were poor, you have different opportunities than if you have parents who are rich um, and on and on it goes. And, you know, one example that really, really struck me was um, there's a story about we've, we've been doing work looking at um, looking at Muslim women in the workplace. One of the stories was about a man, actually, who worked in financial services and every Friday night he went out drinking with his colleagues. He told them he didn't drink because he was a recovering alcoholic rather than to reveal that he was Muslim. And you can imagine, um, you know, the impact that that has on somebody to have to conceal that part of their identity. And of course, the same thing is true when we look at different sexual orientations, when we look at, um, when we look at certain kinds of disabilities, there are a lot of people who have disabilities, whether they're associated with mental health or other kinds of cognitive differences, other kinds of disabilities um, that they never divulge or share because, um, because they're worried about being discriminated against. So really thinking about privilege from a number of different perspectives can help you um, create more inclusion in the workplace. And you know, from our perspective, um, there's 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 little doubt that, that doing a better job in inclusion is not just the right thing to do. It actually has an impact on organizational performance. It actually can create stronger organizations on multiple, um, on multiple dimensions. And there are lots of different groups that can help you get there. So thank you very much. And I will try to stop sharing my screen someone will help me. I think Elaine can take it. Perfect. Thank you so much, Wendy. I have got to say, I have so much to say. Um, that was 
eye-opening um, for so many reasons. And as someone who works in the industry, um, I actually anecdotally would have thought we had moved the needle more than we have. And so um, it really is shocking to see those statistics, um, but also very encouraging to see um, a lot of the work that a lot of the organizations are doing and we're trying to move in the right direction. Um, so I really appreciate you putting all of those statistics together. Um, gosh, I, I can just imagine so many conversations after this that are going to occur. Um, so we're going to put a quick poll up before we do a Q&A. So if I can get uh, Mary Lou or Elaine to pop that poll in, please. Oh, gee, this is like getting a performance review in real time. <laughs> I think going to be hurt. <laughs> So we'll leave it up for about a minute. And uh, if anybody wants to start popping their questions in there, please. Can I vote for myself? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> Actually, I don't think you can. <laughs> Now, I don't see any questions pop up yet, and I, but I have had difficulty. So if, um, Mary Lou, if there are questions and I'm not seeing them, please let me know. Otherwise, I know there's a couple people on here that definitely have got to have a question or two. I don't see any coming through, so I'm going to start us off, Wendy. Um, if you could, for the group, give us a call to action, what would it be? A good question. Um, I think for the group, like as, a, as an association, um, it might make sense to look at those overall statistics and really start to think about targets. One of the things um, Enercan did and I think it was driven by um, the Ministry of Natural Resources, but I I I, I feel like their their uh, their um, uh, what is it equal by thirty is their campaign. I feel like it was it became global, and essentially what it was was a voluntary um, a voluntary industry code where the CEOs of organizations in the industry made a commitment to advancing gender diversity. Now that was their big um, their big thing and you can see why like given where they are on the on the on the list. So you know one thing that you could look at is is there some kind of um, aspirational code that you could you could set for the industry to start moving the conversation forward. Is there data that you could collect? that's a bit more granular than the data that I presented, which is sort of overall where you track. Um, and, and I'm not a big believer in naming and shaming, but I do think comparisons are really helpful. We did a study on the, um, on the legal profession, for example, and we're able to show that some law firms had over 17% um, uh, women in partner, no, I guess it was racialized people in partnership roles, and some had less than one. You know, when we look at engineering schools, some are around 15% women, and some are 30. When you see those kinds of variations within a sector, that tells you that some are doing better than others, and they're doing things that are different. And it isn't just the pool, it's also the intentionality. So, you know, collecting data on where where different companies in the sector are could be useful. I think um, continually to sh continuing to shine a light on leading practices and what works um, could also be helpful. So those would be a few things that occur to me. Oops, perfect, thank you. Um, Mary Lou, can you see if we have any questions coming through? Yes, we have some. So one of them is some of the industries have improved their DNI, such as financial. What was their approach? Good question. So I think it's really important to understand how 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 different the context is for financial 
industries. So first of all, they're federally regulated and they became subject to employment equity legislation in Canada in 1986. And most other countries in the world regulate financial institutions. So the government was able to say, you, you must. Uh, you must report, you must set targets, and your goal should be to have a workforce that is comparable to the population. So financial services were definitely pushed, but I think they were also pulled because remember financial services is also a consumer facing industry. And so they recognized very quickly um, the value of having a diversity and inclusion lens, because if you're, if you're running, um, um, bank branches in Markham, it's actually an advantage to have people who are bilingual, not French and English, but English and Mandarin, for instance. So I think financial services, in, in part, it's the nature of their industry where there was both push from government and pull from their, from, from their consumers. Um, but in natural resources, we see that there are big differences. So companies like Suncor, for example, put made a very decided, deliberate effort to increase Indigenous representation. It was partly because of the, um, the places that they were working. I guess they're probably in the oil sands or something. Um, and they needed, you know, they needed access to talent. So with a very deliberate strategy, they were able to, um, to engage with Indigenous people, for example, and, and, and it goes on and on. They're just different. Um, there, there are certainly sectoral differences that you have to acknowledge and you have to analyze, you know, what's reasonable and what's not. Um, but I think the fact that Canada is, is backward relative to other jurisdictions around the world also tells us there probably is stuff that could be uh, could be different. Okay, uh, another question. Are there tools we can use within our organizations to start the conversation about bias? Really good question. So there's there's lots of there are lots of tools. There are lots of online tools. You know, I'm happy to share the um, I I I like I use the privilege checklist um, a, a lot because what I find is it helps people understand the importance of recognizing differences in experience. There are a lot of men who grew up poor or who had parents who didn't speak English who may have privilege because they're white, but will recognize that there are others who had were disadvantaged in different ways. So sometimes um, starting with a conversation about privilege and, and getting people to really think about how it is that they got where they are and how it is that other people aren't able to, um, sometimes that can help. I find that training, um, everybody goes to training, like training, training, you know, doing unconscious bias training and so on, and we do lots of it. But the fact is, you know, training is really limited in its ability to change behavior. I know if I eat too much and don't exercise, I get fat. Does that stop me? No, not at all. And I think the same thing is true when it comes to issues around um, issues around equity and, and discrimination. We know it's bad, but often what you need is a combination of training and structural change. And that's why I love the organizations that are simply saying, you know, management, figure out how to do this or it's going to affect your bonus. That's the kind of stuff that drives change a lot faster than all of the workshops and sharing. Okay, so a similar kind of question. So what's the audit tool we should use to self-diagnose our company performance? So, you know, we're happy to share and maybe after this, uh, you know, I can put together a care package of stuff that we do, but there are others, there are lots of, you know, you might, as an industry, you might want to look at the Enercan model because that might be sort of a lighter touch than some of the things that we're, we're proposing, but um, I'm happy to put together, uh, you know, lists of things you can use. Some of them are free. 
some of them you have to pay for, but there's lots out there that you can you can apply. Okay, perfect. Super. Are uh, a little bit over time, Wendy. So I apologize for that. Um, yeah, we would love to get uh, any of that information you can share. Um, I do want to let everybody know that uh, Wendy has provided her presentation for us to download in the handouts um, if you'd like to take a peek and perhaps um, share it in your organization. Um, and I just also want to let everyone know that we have another webinar coming up February 25th, which is titled Operationalizing Diversity and Inclusion Through Risk Management. And our speaker is Michael Hartley. And uh, once again, Wendy, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. And anyone who has any extra gold or diamonds can just send them to me, Kara Ryerson. <laughs> okay, perfect. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.